Peace and love, family. Peace and love. Welcome to another Black African Power lecture series. Tonight, family, I have with me our master teacher, Baba M. I'm sorry, I'm about to say Baba M. Wally Moo. Baba M. Hotep. Fatty is in the building, family. And tonight he's going to be talking to us about what it means to be a man in the 21st century, right? African manhood in the 21st century. I know some of y'all have an issue with me saying African, right? As attested by last night, family. Last night I had a good old time. Uh, what a young, what a young lion, a young warrior who uh, who came on and he wanted to challenge me. He actually challenged me on Instagram and then he wanted to, you know, I said, well, look, brother, instead of us uh, going back and forth on this post, you know, let's just have a live discussion about, you know, are we Africans or not? And so he came on and, and kudos to that young brother. It takes guts to come on and, and to talk and share your thoughts and opinions. So anyway, he came on last night and uh, it was me and brother Ankh, and we had a really, really good time. And obviously you all did too, because the video just keeps going up and up and up, right? 300 of you showed up and now the video is like almost at 5,000. And so it was a really good conversation. So family, make sure that you go back and that you check that discussion out, if that's what you want to call it. I feel like we were just kind of having some fun. Um, but the brother wanted to debate us on, you know, whether or not we're African. Of course, you know my position, that we're African, right? And so he said, no, we're not African. Don't call Black Americans African. And so anyway, go back and check it out, family, okay? Right now, take a moment out to thumb up this video. Thumb up this video, okay? You know how the YouTube algorithm works. The more you engage the video, the more it begins, right, to circulate on YouTube. So thumb up the video. Also share this video. Tonight, we're going to be talking about some heavy stuff, right? What it means to be a man in the 21st century, specifically an African man, because that's a difference. We don't just want you to be any man. We want you to be an African man in the 21st century. So family, make sure that you, that you share this discussion, all right? Let's get the views up, all right? Again, we have with us master teacher, Baba Imhotep Fadiou is in the building. And family, make sure that you join us back here, okay, on Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because he's going to give us a historical breakdown of race first and its meaning, okay? So make sure, family, and he schooled me. He said, Doc, did you know it goes all the way back to the 1800s? And he started naming some people I couldn't even tell you about, right? I I, I knew a couple of names, but you know how Bob Emotep is. He started rattling off and he started going in. So I was like, oh, man, Bob, I don't know about that. I don't remember that person. So anyway, he's going to break down, guys, the historical He's going to give us a historical breakdown of race first and its meaning. Because a lot of us think that it started with Marcus Garvey, right? And it didn't, okay? It, it, it didn't. And, and this is no shade to the Honorable Marcus Garvey. I'm just saying that this whole concept of race first did not originate with the Honorable Marcus Garvey. And so he's going to give us this historical breakdown this Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Also, family, let me see if I have any more. Anything else I want to show you? Also, family, make sure that you're in the building for this. Let me share my screen again. I thought I had it all up. Let me share my screen again. This is the, here it is, family. I had to find it. All right. So the Science Fair family on June the 10th, Zyax, Conscious Ingenuity, uh, the Black Agenda have come together to give you a Black Student Science Fair, which is taking place on June the 10th. I know the flyer says 3 p.m., but it's happening at 2 p.m. Right in Brooklyn, New York, family. And make sure that you donate, okay? We're trying to get science kits for children and transport children there. All right, and so I'm going to put the link in the chat. Make sure that you click on this link. Donate $10. It only take a couple of minutes to donate $10. Donate $10. Donate $20. Donate what you can, all right, for us to give this beautiful science fair, or to put on a beautiful science fair, an amazing science fair for black children in the K-12 through system, all right? Some of these kids, as Q Butter shared with me, some of these children in Brooklyn, New York, have never been exposed to STEM because, as you know, STEM is a very extensive uh, resource uh, field, right, or fields. And so it requires a lot of resources, right, in terms of teachers, in terms of equipment. And so a lot of student schools just simply don't have it, especially schools that are in our community. And so we want to make sure that we're a part of the the solution, right? Not just complaining about the problem, but a part of the solution. So family, make sure that if you're in Brooklyn, New York, bring your children out, even if you're not in Brooklyn, because we're driving up from Baltimore. So you might be in a DMV area, wherever you are, right? If you can get over here on June the 10th, make sure that you're in a building, bring your children specifically, because that's who we're trying to target. So make sure you bring your children, children in your family, children in your community. Also family, make sure that you donate. Last but not least, family, last but not least, 
make sure that you enroll your child in the UACI summer camp, STEM camp. All right. And so you see it right here. The UACI STEM camp is going down June the 20th through July the 1st. We have a virtual component and also a physical component, right? And so it's going to be offered in person in Columbia, South Carolina, as well as online. Family, we only have 15 slots. 15 slots for the in-person <laughs> portion or component and 15 slots for the virtual component, okay? So make sure that you get your children enrolled in this STEM program ASAP. And you see it on the screen, family. Our children are gonna be exposed to all sorts of things, all right? Coding, uh, African history as it relates to STEM, um, artificial intelligence, and cybersecurity. All right, and so family, make sure that you get your child enrolled. I'm dropping the link in the chat right now. So be sure to be in the building, family. So without further ado, family, I'm going to bring to you I'm going to bring to you our master teacher, a man that, oh my goodness, a man, when I say that Baba Imhotep is African manhood, he is. When I look at him, I see African manhood um, when I see him. when I And it's not only what I see, I see it in his walk. So I don't want you to think that I'm talking about physically seeing him. I'm talking about when I see him in his walk. He is, he exemplifies African manhood in the way that he speaks, in the way that, sorry, sorry, the way that he thinks, the way that he speaks, and the way that he behaves, how he takes care of his family, how he takes care of his wife, his children, how he takes care of his community, how he leads his organization. He is without a doubt more than qualified some of you might say, well, it would make him qualified to speak on it. He is without a doubt more than qualified to speak on African manhood. It was funny that last night somebody threw in the chat, Dada Ma'at doesn't, oh, she don't respect uh, masculine men. That's because you ain't a masculine man because he has my utmost respect. I want to say that again. It ain't that I, she don't respect that, uh, masculine men. Oh, I respect them. I know when I'm in the presence of a man and I know when I'm in the presence of a boy. And see, men get my respect. Adult boys don't. I want to say that again. Men, divine masculinity gets my respect. Adult male children don't. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on our master teacher, our Baba, the co-founder of Pan-African Liberation Movement, the great, and I'm going to say the great, the honorable Baba Emotep Fadiyu. Peace and love to you, Baba. How are you? Peace, peace. I'm well, Dr. Maya. How you doing today? I'm doing all right. I can't complain, Baba. Just I had to set the record straight. <laughs> I had to set the record straight because they she don't respect. I said, no, no, no. I know when I'm in the presence of a man and I know when I'm in, pre in the presence of an adult male children. And it's a difference, Baba. It's, it's a difference. You know, and I could say that about the women. You, you get what I'm saying? It's a difference, yes. Baba. And so you wrote this wonderful book that I had the opportunity um, to read, African Manhood in the 21st century. Not only did I read it, I purchased copies and I gave it out to all of the men in my family. And so they read it, specifically the youth in the family. They read this book. And so, Baba, I just want to ask you, what, what, before we jump into your presentation, what, what, what made you say, I need to write this book, right? We need a book on African manhood in the 21st century. Why did you write it, Baba? Um, I, <clears throat> I, I wrote the book because... There, there, there was a point in my life about 23 years ago, 20, about 25 years ago, when I was questioned about manhood because I thought I knew what manhood was and I gave this answer that truly was insufficient. And then after realizing that, that was an insufficient answer as what manhood was, I noticed that most of the young people that I engaged around at the time period also didn't have an understanding of what manhood was. Mm. So I began to dedicate myself to just understanding and developing, you know, an idea of manhood based on how our ancestors understood manhood. And then we get, we find ourselves in the year 20, 2015, 2016, things like that. I realized that we have a, a lot of adults, males that are not men because we don't understand what it means to be a man because we don't have a model. There wasn't a model for most of us. And so we are shooting from our hip, attempting to be a man. And I realized that it was insufficient. It was causing um, a disruption in families, destroying relationships. 
and it was weakening our community. So I said, maybe if I put this book together and put it out there, it can begin to give people an idea as to how the black man and or the African man, because I'm using them very interchangeably, should behave and think and act. So that's why I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, Baba. Beautiful. And thank you for that. And, and I have a, a follow up question. Uh, you might have some people in the audience who, who will say, oh, we have Dr. Amos Wilson's uh, book, Manhood in Black and White. Or we have Dr. Naeem Akbar's book, um, Visions for, for Manhood. Right. And there are probably others that I, I can't think of right now. Yeah. So what what separates your book? What differentiates your books, your book from books like, you know, Dr. Amos Wilson's uh, Manhood in Black and White? Uh, vision for Black Men, and so other books like that, The Sacred Man and all of that. What differentiates your books from those books? Great question. So Dr. Naim, I, I mean, um, Dr. Amos Wilson book, I, I referenced his book in this particular book, mm -hmm. but I still believe my book uh, is different. My book is different in the sense that mm -hmm. um, I wanted it to be, I didn't want to just create an elaboration of what manhood was. I wanted to talk about manhood, but then get into the things that a person can take. So I made it more um, prescriptive, instructional, and informative. So mm -hmm. it's something that a person could refer to and model themselves after. I, I created a model in the book. So a person can read the book and come out of the book and understand that this is how one should behave. One can read the book and assess it against him or her, against himself mm -hmm. to see how he is moving and begin to change that. So I think that's what makes my book a, um, a little different if you will. Mm -mm, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Bob. And my last question, Bob, is this. Do you think that women could benefit also, you know, from, from reading your book? <laughs> Interesting question. <laughs> because last night I was doing, um, I was doing a, um, a manhood training, if you will. And one of the things that I said is this. I say that true African manhood can't be separated from womanhood in the sense that, see, an African man have to consider a woman in the process of the manhood that we're talking about because it got to be a manhood that's compatible with woman we just can't build man build men separate from woman so the woman has to have an idea of the type of man that they need to be engaging in the type of man that they need to be involved with their boys so yes men women should be reading this book so they can get a better understanding of the the, the, the quality of the manhood that we have to begin to seek and push in our society and understand that there's a distinct difference between maleness and manliness. Yes, it is. Come on, Baba. Oh, I can't. I know you're going to drop it, family. Family, let, Baba, look, I know I said that's my last question. Your cash app is Baba Emotep. That's it, right? Um, Yes, cash app Baba Emotep, yeah. All right, so family, I'm dropping his cash app in the chat. Before we even get tonight's discussion presentation started i want you to send a love donation to him and you know i asked this of baba baruti and every speaker that's coming on i have some phenomenal speakers coming on tonight tonight and then i'm not tonight friday and then next week right now i want you to take out your phone take out your phone right here with me right now i'm going to cash app i'm going to the cash app sign oh let me look for it on my phone <laughs> baba look i'm looking for it on my phone okay i'm right there Family, let's send him a love donation right now, right now. And I'm going to ask you to do this at the beginning. And I'm going to ask folks who are coming in to do this towards the end. Again, this is reciprocity. We went over this, family. We went over this the first time that Baba Baruti came on. You know, tonight you're going to be getting a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge. And this stuff takes time, right? And so we want to make sure that we reciprocate. We First of all, we can't reciprocate enough what he's going to give us tonight. But we can give him something. We can give him a token of our appreciation of what he's getting ready to do. So, family, make sure that you join me in Cash App and Baba Imhotep right now. Dollar sign Baba Imhotep. All right? Let's Cash App him. Let's show Baba that we appreciate what he's getting ready to do. And then, Baba, we're going to do it again, right, to show you that we appreciate what you did. Ashe, family, if you hear me, I want you to put an Ashe in the chat. If you understood the instructions, put an Ashe in the chat. If you understood the charge. Put Ashe in the chat. Put Ashe in the chat. All right, family, here we go. All right, Baba, let me put up, pull up your screen. There you go, Baba, the floor is yours. Okay. So African manhood in the 21st century. But before I get into it, 
I, I oftentimes like to make this brief statement. It's never my intent to offend nor, nor um, insult any individual that may be listening to my lectures or my presentations, but I'm always moved by an ancestral imperative and I can only tell you the truth. I can only present the truth to you in such a brutal way that oftentimes you may think that I'm trying to hurt you, but I'm not. But I'm bringing the truth that we need that's good for us, that's good for our spirits. So I ask if everyone is listening, allow yourself to be open-minded and I can guarantee you that you're gonna walk out of this presentation transformed. So let's start this journey, African manhood in the 21st century. Why the 21st century? I say the 21st century because I wanted to make a distinction that I'm talking about how we need to be. Those of us who are here now, how we need to be, how we need to be thinking, speaking, and acting. So African manhood in the 21st century. Age and gender are insignificant indicators of African manhood. So some of you may know these names. I'm not going to go you know, name the people that's here, but I want to put these three individuals up here, Cleo, Clarence Thomas, and James Baldwin. Because these three are what we would define as being a black male or an African male. Neither of them are African men. So I need to make the distinction up front because oftentimes we classify male black males as black men, but I want us to know that we have to get to the place where we can make the distinction. Because there is a distinction. These three are males, not men. We must not make the mistake of confusing an African male with an African man. There is a qualitative difference between the two. Although every African man is an African male, the reverse does not hold true. Every African male is not an African man. Maleness is an anatomical designation. Anatomy is necessary to African manhood, but anatomy is not the sole determinant of African manhood. African manhood, to a large degree, is psychosocially and spiritually determined. African manhood is a cultural designation. It's a cultural designation. What I want us to understand is that manhood is what African or black males must move into. But we move into it by having models of black men or African men to look to. The models gives us something to aspire to. So African manhood as a cultural designation becomes an aspiration. It's an aspiration that's guided by other men to take boys and land boys within the port of manhood. What, what I'm saying is this. I'm saying that men must take boys to manhood. And we must know that we must transcend, transcend beyond just being male. Male is just the, the biological things, the anatomical things. It's, it's the desires, right? It's the impulses. That's all maleness. Manhood is some extra added stuff. Manhood is when we step into the realm of discipline, purpose, resourcefulness, understanding. Manhood is that. Manhood is understanding that my decisions is linked to a larger audience, not just about me. Manhood is communal maleness itself. Manhood is collective. But you don't, you're not born that way. So you're not born man, you're born male to become man. African manhood does not follow some type of biological and physiological linear course of development from African maleness through boyhood to African manhood. It does not work like that. You do not age or grow into African manhood. It is not something you become by default just because you are an African male. African manhood does not just happen. African manhood is what you as an African male aspire to become. 
many of our people are of the mindset that a little a little boy is born, he go through puberty, adolescent, he enters adulthood, and he becomes a man. Because that's what white folks have told us. And white folks have presented themselves as being the authority on everything. So whatever they say, how they say it, they use their sociologists, their psychologists, their psychiatrists, their historians. They use all those individuals to craft a misunderstanding about what it means to be an African man based on what it means to be a white man. So they use white maleness as the standard and present it to everyone as if this is how things are. And then we grow up in our society, in our communities, in our families, assuming that boys turn 18 and become men. And then we start making all these demands, asking them to do man to, to do manly things that they are incapable of doing because they haven't been trained or taught or shown how to be a man because manhood is not what you're born as. So what I'm saying is that, you know, we don't move from maleness to manhood automatically, but yes, that is the trajectory, but the manhood part is what we have to become. So by birth, when there's a boy that's born, he instantly must be inducted into a process of becoming a man. Instantly, he has to be inducted into a process of becoming a man. First couple of years, he's going to spend with his mother because she's going to breastfeed. I'm talking about the African way, the true black way. She's going to breastfeed the little boy. But around age three, you're going to see the little boy spending more time with his father. So his father can begin to show him what a man does, how a man is. He's going to show him that by way of actions. He's going to show him how to treat the, his mother which is the father's wife. He's going to teach the little boy how to be gentle, how to be passionate and loving and caring and how to protect the family. You're going to make sure the boy see him in action. And he's going to communicate that to the little boy. He's going to oftentimes make the distinction between what it means to be a man and what it means to not be a man because the boy don't, don't know. So the boy at times will make mistakes. And as he makes his mistakes going through his process of manliness, the father has to redirect him. Every time he make a mistake, that's not manly, the father has to let him know men don't do that. Men don't behave that way. And then bring him back into the process of manhood because it's the father's responsibility in collaboration with all the other men in that particular community or family to get that boy to the port of manhood. To get him to the port of manhood so he understands what he is to be doing as he gets along. So these pictures here, I have these pictures of African men who have stood up as African men. African manhood in the 21st century rightfully translates into African warriorhood. African warriorhood. African warriorhood. We oftentimes hear it and oftentimes we, we, we cringe against it and we push back. What are you talking about warrior? We push back because once again, white folk have took it upon themselves to define for you what it means to be a warrior. And they handed you this watered down definition. And you are subscribing to their definition and pushing against what you are by nature and what every single black boy who came into the world is by nature a warrior. So for us, warrior doesn't mean rugged. It doesn't mean to be um, recklessly violent. It doesn't mean to be indisciplined. It doesn't mean to be chaotic. That's not us. It doesn't mean to be savage and barbarians, right? That's not us. When we say warrior, we're talking about the highest specimen of a black man. That's what we're talking about. A, a black man that's highly disciplined, refined, and enhanced, clear, on purpose, on cue, building a family, defending the nation, and pushing the mission to sovereignty. That's what we mean by warriorhood. Not, not something that's out here that's moving to appetite. Not something that's out here that's, re that's reacting to everything white folks do. That's not warrior. Warrior does not behave and operate in a reactionary mode, warrior is revolutionary through and through, intentional and willful at its core, very intentional and willful at its core, and centered on what it means to be a warrior, anchored within his culture. So that's what we mean. So I'm saying African manhood in the 21st century 
rightfully translates into African warriorhood, I'm saying that the African man must be highly disciplined, refined, enhanced, on cue, on purpose, vision driven, going after sovereignty. And any and everything that's in the way of sovereignty must be removed. That's what I'm saying. When we say you want to be a warrior, a 21st century African man must be battle and combat ready. He must understand that war is being waged against his people, African people, and prepare himself to defend and protect his people, even at the cost of losing his life. Prepare himself to defend and protect his people. But this defending and protecting isn't just on the quote unquote battlefield in the sense of combat, right? So when I say battle and combat, I'm not talking about the traditional stuff. You know, I'm not talking about just picking up the gun, the, AT, the, the AR-15s. And, no, that's not just that. That's an aspect that's necessary. Urban and guerrilla warfare is necessary, but you have to do battle in the boardroom. You have to do battle in the corporate office. You have to do battle in the courtroom. Wherever you find yourself at black man, that's your battlefield. And if black people are there, oftentimes they don't even see what's happening. Oftentimes they're being victimized, don't even realize they've been victimized. But if you're a true black man, you see them being victimized. It's your responsibility in that instance to do what black men do. Don't stand by and act as if you don't see what's occurring. You do what black men do. They step up to the occasion. So if you're a politician, and you know, and if you're a politician and you are a black man, then you have to fight for the black race in that arena. If you're a black man and you just so happen to be working on one of these crazy corporate jobs, then you gotta stand up for black people. You can't be sitting in there listening, smiling from ear to ear when they're talking about how they're gonna put forth these um commercials and export black people. You can't be in there all uh, giggly giggly. You gotta open your face up and talk and do something and challenge it. You have to push back. You have to let them know that, hey, no, 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 not on my watch. That's what this is about. But you can't say I'm gonna be quiet because I'm afraid to lose my job. Because to be a black man is to be what? I said it, to be resourceful, to be purpose-driven. So therefore, the job should not be the thing that you totally rely upon if you do have the job. You should not be um, totally relying upon it so therefore they can, they can control you because you now you're being afraid to lose the job. If that is your situation, then you are slipping as a black man. You have to rectify that situation and change that dynamic. Never be, never allow yourself to be put in a situation where you cannot be 100% black man because you're afraid that you're going to lose something. Think about it. And think about what all the other black men that we know of, that we call when you pull our base and think how they have behaved, how they was thinking and what they have done, what they have given for us. We too must come in the same fashion as did they. To be an African man is to be at war with all those warring against African people. To be an African man is to be at war with all those warring against African people. White people, black Negroes, black traders, and all other foreigners who are truly no friend of African people. So yes, the Chinese, the Japs, and everybody else, right? You have to understand that all that is moving against us. And part of your manhood is to defend your people. It's to make boys aware of this, to defend black women, to defend the black family, to defend the black community, to stand up for your people. That's your charge. White terrorism is that which is against us principally. And this is how I define white terrorism. White terrorism is the organized execution of white aggression against and the concentration of violence upon 
black people to consolidate and sustain white power to effect white dominance. So think about it. When you, when you talk about racism, when you talk about miseducation, when you talk about medical apartheid, you're talking about white terrorism. When you talk about mass incarceration, you're talking about white terrorism. When we, when we say, well, they owe, owe black oppression, white terrorism. When you say racism, it's white terrorism. You talk about police brutality, it's white terrorism. It's white terrorism across the board. Every single thing that you can think of that have worked against black people, African people in a very adverse way, in a very crippling way, it's nothing more or nothing less than white terrorism. It serves a purpose, it serves a function. And black men have to be aware of this. We have to know that this is real. We have to know that this exists and that everything in our power has to be geared towards dismantling this. Everything and every single child that you give birth to, that you bring, that you're part of the birthing process that you bring into this world, that you father has to be made aware of what's happening. We cannot say we are fathers of black men, but yet we do not make our children aware of the dangers of the world. That's not African manhood. That's not African manhood. African manhood requires of you to inform and make aware to your children that as a people, war is being waged upon us. And every single child that come to this world they come to this world to take part in the great push for African sovereignty. None of our children come to this world to stand on the sideline. When black children stand on the sideline, it's because black men and black women have not made them aware of their role in the struggle. And that's a failure. An African man is moved by a communal initiative and guided by a spiritual imperative. He cannot be at ease with social degeneration, okay with economic robbery, and cool with the political oppression of African people. He cannot just go about his daily routine as if everything is normal. The African within him, his warrior principle, will compel him to take a stance against this type of injustice. It will inform his decisions and instruct his actions. It will not allow him to be comfortable. It will gnaw at his soul, agitate his spirit, and consume his mind. There is no such thing as a comfortable, undisturbed African man within my offer. Let me say that last part again. There is no such thing as a comfortable, undisturbed African man within my offer. If you find an African male that's comfortable and undisturbed, I'm going to show you somebody that's not an African man. Because the African manhood is warriorhood, right? And if you understand what it means to be a warrior, you cannot be okay with the destruction of your people. Witnessing the destruction of your people and you are a warrior. You cannot just get up in the morning, head off to work, do eight hours, come home and go back in your house, kick your feet up maybe, Watch a little bit of TV, maybe. Take a shower, maybe. Eat some food, maybe. Play some cards, maybe. Or jump on the video game, maybe. You just cannot do that and say you're an African man and you're not taking any part in getting rid of the perpetrators who have heaped the jump onto the black people nor are you engaged in any processes to push and advance the black race forward. You cannot go about your daily routine as if, as if everything is okay and you still want to claim African manhood. That's a contradiction. So the question could be asked. I think you being unfair, Bob and Hotel. Why Bubba can't say he a man if he's taking care of his family? He's taking care of his family. He's going to work. He's paying his bills. Why are you saying that? Now, I'm telling you why I'm saying it. It's because in 
every time period, there's a standard for manhood. Manhood is never loosely defined, and manhood is, is never every person for himself. It's never that. When you look into history and you study the people, hypothetically speaking, if you look at the Zulus, it was a standard for the Zulus. The Zulu men were warriors. They, they were warriors. That was the standard. I mean, when you look into history and look at, or rather look into our story and look at any group of us, you'll see that the men typically conform to the same basic thought process that rendered the same types of behaviors rather than so many different types of behaviors. They mostly adapted to and adopted the same basic principles that regulated how they were going to interact. You don't look into our story and find any one of our societies where the men we're just able to self-define. Everybody self-define. Well, this is how I define what it means to be a man. You define it that way, I define it this way. No, because remember, manhood is not the, the biological thing. See, manhood is something additional, right? It's some other stuff. It's, it's, it's some psychological and social and spiritual stuff, right? And that stuff there is not just um, arbitrary. You know what I'm saying? That's established. That's communally established. That's not arbitrary. You can't arbitrarily just say, I'm a man, and this is what it is. Now, I know we have behaved that way in this society because we behave like white people. And I know a lot of us think that way because we in this society. But because of that way of thinking and because of that way of behaving, that's why we're in the mess we're in now. That's why you find so many sisters online complaining about black men. But you're really not complaining about a black man. You really complain about a black male because a black man would not have done the things that you are what accusing this male of. Black men understand their responsibilities and obligations to the black woman. They understand that she's a natural compliment. So they're not going to do those things that we see online when we talk about these quote unquote gender wars between the we say the black man and the black woman. No, it's not. That's not the black man and the black woman. That's not, that's not what you're witnessing. And we have to be very clear in our description. That's not what you're witnessing. You're witnessing um, women, black women, potentially, who have chosen to be in relationships with black males, adult boys, who fail in some areas of what it means to be a man because they have yet, they have yet to arrive at the station of manhood. And because they had yet to arrive at the station of manhood, it was incapable of performing and being a man. And that's because we have, we have been subscribing to every person define himself what it is to be a man. You even, you even hear people saying this right here. Yeah, he might be gay, but he's still a man. That's weird. We say stuff like that. Yeah, he might be gay, but he's still a man. No, he's not a man. Because African manhood is not confused about their sexual identity. There's no confusion there at all. For an African man. Yes, he's an African male. He's a black male. No doubt. That's what he is. But don't confuse. And because of the confusion in the way we have been using the confusion because we don't understand many things that should be understood from a culture point of view, we're actually behaving and operating from with the from within um a womb of Euro confusion. The confusion that's handicapping us as a people is the confusion that we have inherited from white people. We have brought over their confusion and we are trying to live our lives through their confusion. And it can't be done. So there is no such thing as a comfortable, undisturbed African man within my alpha. African manhood is actualized, not verbalized. During times of crisis, times of despair, dismay, and adversity, African men do the impossible. They man up and stand up. You don't find African men complaining. So when you hear a lot of people that's complaining, you're dealing with a boy. I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know up front. Malcolm X didn't complain. I can run him down. You know, I only got to go through it. Y'all know him. You watch him online, on YouTube. You read about him. You engage him. You don't find 
warriors complaining. You find them thinking, assessing the situation, strategizing, and then executing. Simple as that. No complaint. So when you're online and you hear all of these complaints, people complaining about this, complaining about that, you're, dealing, you, you're witnessing adult boys. Adult boys, right? When you when you got people going to say, I'm a man, I'm a man, right? I don't have to tell you that I'm a man because if you're paying attention, you want to arrive at that conclusion by way of how I act. I don't have to tell you I'm a man. If you're paying attention the correct way, you will arrive at that conclusion on your own. And not only will you arrive at the conclusion that Bobby Hotel is a man, you're going to arrive at the conclusion that he's a good man. He's a highly qualified man. He's a stand-up guy. He's a principled man. You're going to arrive at those conclusions as well. So get out the get out the mindset of letting somebody keep on actualizing. Oh, I'm an alpha male. You know what I'm saying? That's not even our way of thinking. That's not even African thinking that way. Alpha male, and we repeat that. We have to give all those concepts and thinking back to white folks. And even though I know black people use it, and some of these black people are very popular and you like listening to them, they say it. But that's not how we think about who we were as African people before we encountered white people. We saw ourselves differently before we encountered these individuals. So don't worry about what a person is saying. Watch what they are doing. In most cases, you're going to find African men involved in a highly successful relationship with a black woman. You're not going to find a black man out here just running around, you know what I'm saying, single for years. For years. And, and we justify that. Why are you single for years? Why are you single for five and six and seven and eight years but you said you're a man. You're not, incapable, you're not capable of connecting with a woman? You mean to tell me you can't even attract a compliment in your space to build with? Stop letting people actualize. I mean, stop letting people verbalize over actualizing. Because many people can master the art of eloquence in rhetoric, if you study it, you can become great at eloquence. And you can sell that to people. I'm a man. I'm an alpha man. All this other crap that come with it. I'm a revolutionary. You gotta say all of that stuff if you live in it. I'm Afrocentric. I'm a pan Africanist. You gotta say it if you live in it. And that's what distinguishes an African man from an African male. The male is gonna consistently try to convince you that he is something that he's not. The African man is not worried about trying to convince you. He's just going to do what he has been called to do. If you recognize him for what he is, that's up to you. But he's really not concerned about whether or not you see him for that or not. Because he's only concerned with making sure he's doing what he has been commissioned to do by way of the ancestors. That's African manhood in the 21st century. 13 attributes of African manhood. And, and these are not the only ones. These are 13 that I want to I wanted to highlight. Integrity. He, he, he has integrity. He's genuine. He has resolve. He has fortitude. He's intrepid, fearless. He's righteous. He's orderly. I'm going to tell you why orderly is there. Because many of us might ask the question, why orderly there? Right? I'm going to tell you why. A disorganized person. A disorganized male is not an um, is not an African man, right? Now I'm not saying that you got everything together and you got all your little areas all of order, so on and so forth, right? But an African man understands the principle of order. The reason he understands the principle of order, it takes order to be in a relationship to build a family. It takes order to be in an organization and regulate an organization. When there's a lack of order, you can't do none of that. You can't do none of that. You cannot rear your children and you don't have order. It requires order to rear children because children re requires structure. And if you don't have any order, you don't understand the concept of structure and you can't implement structure. So if you can't implement structure in the lives of your children, then you're incapable of rearing children. And as African men, we don't just raise our children, we rear our children. 
and it requires order to do that. A disorderly man or male will never rear children. And because he would never rear children, he would only raise children. Those children will have massive gaps in their development. Massive gaps within their development because it requires structure. And structure follows order. Empathy. He has to have some empathy for himself, his loved ones, and his people. Right? He has to have honor. If you say it, then you see it through. Your word is your bond. Your bond is your word. And your word is your honor. You think before you speak. Your word means something. That's not something you take lightly. You don't go back on your word and then say, my bad. The junk that we do. We do a bunch of junk. Break our words, my bad. And we smirk them. We even smirk them when we say, my bad. Or we smile when we say, my bad. Or we'll send a text and say, my bad, and say laughing out loud. Oh, that's boyish stuff. That's boyish and childish. Because men don't break their word. You don't make a habit of breaking your word. How can I trust you if your word is no good? If your word is no good, then you're no good. As simple as that, I can't detach you from your word. You are your word. Ethical. We must be ethical. If you're in an organization and you're the leader of the organization, you don't be running around inside the organization trying to have sex with all the women and trying to use your position of authority and using your, your status as a way to, you know, to, 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 um, to commit sacrilege against these women. You don't do that. You got some ethical stuff about you. You got to be ethical. You got to know they are the limit. You can't do that. Furthermore, you shouldn't even be in the position of leadership in the organization. I mean, running the organization if you don't got a woman anyway. Excellence. Black men must be excellent. Purposeful. Have a purpose, driven by a purpose, heading towards a purpose. And centered. Centered in the sense that you are anchored in your culture and your history. Our story. So those are the 13 attributes that I highlight. They're very important attributes. We need to strive towards making sure that we are practicing these and that they are a part of who we are. I live by all 13. This is the double cornerstone. The double cornerstones of African manhood are responsibility and accountability. And the reason why I put these two here, because oftentimes we hear a lot of people talking about, well, you know, a man is, uh, 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 to be a man is to handle your responsibility. But you never hear people talk about accountability. They always talk about responsibility. And then if you even ask them about responsibility, what they're going to say is this, well, he pay his bills and take his family. That's why they're going to say. Because they actually are repeating once again what white folks have said. They'll be, they'll be regurgitating white junk. So I said, no, it's a double cornerstone, responsibility. Responsibility refers, refers to executing your duties of providing for, protecting, securing, and nurturing yourself, family, and community. You notice I didn't just leave it talking about you, right? See, 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 manhood, manhood for us is only as relevant as the manhood impacts our community in a positive way. Our manhood isn't something that's solely ours. It's not a private thing. My man, African manhood isn't private. You know, it's not private. It's, the, it's no different if you was a public servant. You're not a public servant to yourself. You know, you're not the president, quote unquote, to yourself. You're the president of this particular office so you can execute unique responsibilities and duties for a larger body. And that's the same way you got to understand manhood. So your responsibility is not just to you. It's to your family and your community. African manhood says this. If boys do not have a father in their lives and you are near those boys, have access to those boys, are aware of those boys, then you enter into their life. They become your responsibility as well. Accountability. Accountability refers to your ability to acknowledge, own, and rectify your mess, your mistakes. Accountability deals with acceptance and self-correction. Once again, when you make a mistake, when you do something that you shouldn't be doing, when you out of pocket, 
You don't try to justify. You don't try to weasel out of it. The attempt to justify it, the attempt to weasel out of it, the, when you push him back, are all indicators that you are still immature and this boyishness showing up. Again, because as a man, you understand accountability is necessary to your manhood. It's necessary to your manhood to be able to exercise the ability to own your own junk. Not trying to weasel out of it. Not trying to turn it back on to the other person. Not attempting to make the other person feel bad for attempting to do his or her job and hold you accountable. That's the stuff we do inside our organizations. We make it so hard for the leaders in the organizations, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> we make it so hard for the leaders inside our organizations to do and execute their functions. You know, they try to hold you accountable to the rules and regulations. And the only thing you want to do is try to flip it back on that leader. You know, you want to try to weasel out of it. You no, know, that, that's boyishness. And we have to grow up and grow out of that. So I'm saying that responsibility and accountability are the double cornerstones of man. I'm saying you have to be responsible, no doubt, but not just to paying bills to some white people. You know? No, you can pay your, you can put your bills on auto pay and do that. Come on now. We got to do more than that. You notice I say protect, secure, and nurture. Uh, you very rarely hear people talking about that the black man should be nurturing. We think that the black women are the only nurturers. No, black men must nurture as well and understand how to nurture. It's a part of, part of being a man. Now, this is a question of gentleness. It, it, it oftentimes come up. And I like to say bound up in African manhood is the quality of gentleness. By gentle is meant the capacity to nurture the humanity within your loved ones. This requires sensitivity, understanding, delicacy, compassion, and love. Not rough and tough. Because a lot of us believe that we got to be rough and tough to be a man. So we have no gentleness. There's no gentleness that comes out of We think gentleness is, um, is, is weakness. I remember um, um, reading a quote that was made by, uh, it was a statement that um, Dr. Betty Shabazz made one time about Malcolm X. And what she said is that, she said Malcolm X was one of the most gentle men she ever knew. She said, but you would never know that if you judged him by what you saw in society. And the reason being is this, see, gentleness is reserved for your loved ones. See, rough and tough is reserved for your enemies. So to be an African man, you have to know how to be gentle with your wife, your family, your community, and your children. And you must be equally rough, tough, and aggressive, and violent with your enemies. You must know how to do that. But don't think that gentleness is weakness. It takes a lot of strength, a lot of maturity, a lot of understanding, a lot of self-attunement to be able to operate from a place of gentleness with your loved ones. Children teach you that. That's one of the reasons why we need to have children so we can learn how to be gentle because children are so delicate. You need to have children, but not just out here making babies. You need to be in a complementary relationship with a woman that you and her have committed to one another to operate and function in a very reciprocal way on the basis of my acts to build power and nation build and to rear children together. Once you have come to that agreement and you bring a child or children into this world and you as a man begin to interact with your children, you will begin to learn what it means to be gentle, especially if you have little girls. African manhood is about having good character. By good character is meant righteous behavior, right actions. Character defines you. Character is not what you profess to be. Character is what you are. The true mark of a man is his character. So I wanted to talk about character because oftentimes 
we leave character, the conversation of character isn't engaged. But character has to be engaged. We are what we do. I don't care what you conjure up in your mind and tell yourself you are. If you're not, if you're not doing it, then you're not it. We are what we do. If you consistently act other than a man, then you are other than a man. I'm not going to watch you act other than a man and keep calling you a man. I'm not going to watch you act as a boy and keep calling you a man. I'm not going to watch you act feminine, overly feminine, and call you a man. I'm not going to watch you act cowardly like a coward and call you a man i'm not going to act watch you act as a traitor and call you a man no the moment you turn into a traitor you're not an african man african men don't trade you know you lose that yeah so your manhood is what you work on every day all right you don't become a man and you just automatically retain it the rest of your life regardless of what you do no you got to work on it every day. That's why it's very important for you as a man to be situated around men so you can consistently strengthen your manhood. Because it's not something that's just going to automatically be with you. You can most definitely forfeit it, your manhood status. You can commit, <laughs> you can commit malfeasance in the office of manhood and be invalidated. African manhood is about African survival. It mandates that every African man know how to do the following. Help himself, family, and people. Rely upon himself, family, and people. And preserve himself, family, and people. <clears throat> this is the basis. This right here is the three basic laws that we need to understand. We have to be able to do this. We have to be able to help ourselves do for self, do for family, do for our people. We have to be able to only rely upon our people. Now, let me clarify reliance. Because I know oftentimes the way our minds work, once again, we've been so Europeanized that we heard reliance and we think I'm saying that, you know, you can't take nothing. You can't, you know, um, receive nothing from anybody else. I'm not saying you can't receive. I'm saying don't be reliant upon. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that if you work, you just so happen working at a European corporation that you're supposed to quit. I'm not saying that. I'm saying don't be reliant upon it. I'm saying that don't allow... Um, your livelihood to be 100% based upon it, right? Because then you're a slave to it. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying be, be reliant upon ourselves, our family, our people. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying preserve yourself, right? Preserve your family and preserve your people. This is how we get to African sovereignty. There's no other route to it other than this. And we each should be striving and pushing and moving towards African sovereignty as African men. The 21st century African man is a symbol of strength and power for his wife and a supreme hero to his children. He is a solid foundation upon which generations of African people can build upon. He is defined and directed by a clearly defined purpose. Every African man that we can think of if we was to sit down and go through our story and start putting up all the African men that we know, we can link each and every one of them to a legacy. You can't pinpoint a single African man in our history, our story, that you cannot link to a legacy. Each and every one have done work and was doing work for the people that any one of us can come along and continue to do the same work. Every single one. So that's why I say he is a solid foundation upon which generations of African people can build upon. If you are not driven by purpose, building legacy, building organizational structure, right? And you don't have to be doing this by yourself. It's critical to be linked up with organization. Everybody don't have to go out and try to start an organization. And we don't have to do all of that, right? All we have to do is identify with brothers, organizations that's already doing the work and figure out if, if, if their principles and, and thought process match yours, 
to figure out how you can build into what they're doing and build with them to add on to it and build together and be a part of that process. That's what it comes down to. But we should, none of us who profess to be an African man, a black man, should ever be standing by idle and not working for the race. Standing by and not working for the race invalidates your claim to manhood. African men in the 21st century must be freedom fighters, revolutionaries, warriors, thinkers, doers, protectors, and defenders of African life, and many other things, but I stopped it there. But these are some of the living examples that I wanted to put here. I wanted to put some living examples who are still here in the flesh, struggling, fighting, doing the work for African people. Right? You, we, we have to understand that manhood is an office. It's the same as it's, it's the same as if one is trying to become a senator or a congressman. Right? Manhood is an office, and that office has duties and responsibilities that you must fulfill. You can't just say, I'm a man, and then you're not working. You're not doing anything. You're not building family. You're not treating women right. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. And all of the words that I've read in this presentation comes from this book here. So all of the words were my words. Those pictures were just um, African men that I chose to identify. And I just wanted those pictures there so we can see. Um, but none of those words were any of theirs, all my words. All right, Baba, let me drop this bomb for you. That was just, I'm over here like blown. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Let's let's give it up for Bible. Let's throw those fire symbols in the chat, family. Let's throw those fire symbols in the chat, family. Baba, let me show you these accolades. People are going in. People said, oh, appreciate you, Sister LaShawn, Mama Gina. She said, donation sent. Thank you, Baba, for the master lesson, Ashe. Dr. Craig Samuels in the building. He said, excellent presentation. And, Doc, I got your message. I, I just hit you back on Facebook. So check your message, Doc. Who else we have in the building? Oh man, this is this sister right here. She's a warrior. Akachinike. I hope I didn't butcher her name, but she's a warrior. She's a warrior. Peace and love to your queen. I read all your comments from yesterday. This is a warrior queen on the screen, Baba. S.A. Smith, Baba. I just want to show you all the love that people are sending you right now. Nothing but love. Nothing but love, Baba. Miss Nomad, peace and love to you. Octo, peace. Look at this, Baba, all of this. Ifa Benji, S.A. Smith, Jabril, peace and love. They said incredible, incredible lecture. Topic, topic, tire, tire, Baba. <laughs> top, I think it says top, top tier. I'm sorry, I said tire, top, top tier. Uh, Jonathan Hargrove, Baba, yeah, they, they, they're they loving it. Peace and love, Tiffany. Tiffany's in the building. She sit the fire symbols. Brother John, Brother Basir, Ali. Onk Life products. My E5 twins are in the building. He said, powerful presentation, Baba. Moses Lane. LaShawn got the infamous African Dr. Craig. It goes on, Baba. It's people just, people, they, they going off, Baba, right now. Sister Marcia Pender said, my son will be reading this book this summer. She doesn't play. This is a sister that has an African-centered, you know, homeschool program. That's so great. she, yeah. So she said, my son will be reading and sis, you won't be disappointed. Loban said, is there an ebook version, Baba? Is there an ebook version for you? No, Baba? unfortunately there is not an ebook version for this. All right. Who we got? Is that Segun? Fat to you? Power comrade. So people in the building, Baba. Dakari said, Asante Sana, Baba, for your work. All right. Badu is the fire signs. 
I mean, Bob, I'm just going to show, I'm just going through. They say you never disappoint. Bulagoon, Bulagoon. That's a warrior right there, too. I know the Bulagoons. So that makes perfect sense why Baba Baruti spoke so highly of Baba Emotep. Absolutely, he did. And on the last presentation, when I said I was bringing you on, Baba, yes. he was like, y'all in for a treat. He said, y'all, he said, you got to go back the last probably like five minutes Baba Baruti spoke about you. He spoke very, very highly of you. He said, y'all are in for a treat. So peace and love to you, Jabril Africa. I see Baba Gregory's in the building. Peace and love to you, goddess Jimmy Yah is in the building. I see Prince Jawans is in the building. Say he said, I love you, Baba. So Prince Jawans, the fatty you said, I love you, Baba. That's the warrior, Baba, who walked me to my car. So here it is, Baba. You know, I, you know, I'm Baltimore, so I'm walking out. You know, he's like, sister, can I walk to your car? I'm like, no, brother, I'm parked over there. You know, my little ditty bop, Baba. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, brother, I'm parked right there. He was like, no, I'm going to walk you to your car. He said, I'm going to make sure you get to your car safe. And that's when, Bob, I was like, you know what? Got to let a man, you know, got to let a man be a man. Let me sit back. Let me, let me do what he, you know, let me just sit yes. back. And I just said, I said, you are hundred percent correct, brother. And I said, thank you so much. And he walked my mother and I to the car. Cause at first I'm like, you know, it's like Baba, um, just being candid with you and the people are listening and people know my story. Whoever tuned in, they, they know my story. Um, how my mom uh, raised my brother and I as a single mother. And, you know, my dad, not speaking disparagingly about him, um, he was, you know, kind of in and out. He wasn't as consistent as I wanted him to be, Baba, you know, in my life. And so, you know, I grew up, Baba, having, you know, and then my brother was 11 years older than me. So by the time I was like six or seven, he was gone. He had moved out of the house, you know, by the time, mm -hmm. by the time he was 18. So now it's just me and my mom, you know. And so, Baba, I'm outside. I'm fighting the guys you know, <laughs> fighting, doing all kinds of stuff, Bob, just running around, you know, and I was the only girl in the pack. So you can imagine how that was. I was, you know, I was the only girl in the pack uh, in my neighborhood where, where I lived. I grew up actually, it was a, a um, house down the street, five boys lived down the street. So I'm rolling with them, Bob, I'm breaking my ankle. I'm falling out of trees, doing all kinds of stuff until I hit puberty. So anyway, Bob, I say all that to say that you, you, you grow up and, um, I just wasn't accustomed. And so that's why I'm just saying it so brother Jawanza can understand why he got that from me. I wasn't used to that, Baba. You know how you just kind of used to, you used to trying to def defending yourself and you used to, I'm, I got it, I can protect myself. So then, you know, a man comes around, he's like, it's like, oh, so as, as just as a woman, I had to learn, I got to learn, you understand, Baba, to what? accept that because you get so used to defending yourself and providing for yourself. And then when a man comes along and say, well, sweetie, I could do that for you. I can help you out with that, baby. You're like, what? So you got to actually like deprogram yourself to even accept the help, to accept the covering, to accept the protection. And so I say all that to say, Prince Jawanza Fatty, you, I appreciate you, brother. And he'll tell you, he'll tell you, I was walking by, I got you, okay? He said, no, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. And you know what I said, Baba? You got that, brother. Let's go. Let's go. He walked me to my car and he made sure my mother and I got safe. And so anyway, pre peace and love to you, Prince Jawaza. Thank you so much for tuning in, brother. So I see Malik Long, the fire symbols. Says the information, Sister Quarles says the information, knowledge, and examples are crucial for our revolution and advancement. Sister Amasa Penda, she said, I got two copies of this book. And not only will my son be reading this book, so will his father, my husband. Oh, man. Hold yeah. I gotta drop a bomb. Fire! 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 Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Who else we have in the building? Malik said, Peace, Bobas. Who's that? Suntan said, Strong words, brother. And Prince Jawanza said, Thank you, Dr. Maat. I listen to all shows while I'm at work every day, at least one episode a day. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Warrior. I appreciate you. Bulagoon said powerful Baba. All right, Baba. So I think I covered everything. Okay, here it is. Someone said, what is the best way to reach Baba and family? What I'm going to do while he gives you that, I'm going to drop the link in the chat. So if you want to come in, this is Q&A time. If you want to come in right now, yeah, if you want to come in and ask Baba some questions, I just dropped the link in the chat. All right, so join us. I'm just dropped the link in the chat and I'll do it again. All right, I'll do it again. So, Baba, what is the best way to contact you and to get your book and any additional, the you know, books best, that you have? The best and easiest way to really get to me will be through Facebook. You know, just, you know, find me on Facebook and message me through Facebook or message me through Instagram. 
Um, M Hotel Fatu on Instagram, Bob M Hotel on Facebook. Beautiful, beautiful family. Come on in. I dropped the link in the chat. <clears throat> I dropped the link in the chat. Peace and love to y'all, Thomas. He said, Peace, Baba, Black African power to you, Baba. But peace out, Thomas. Peace, peace and love to you. Family, come on in. Right now is QA time. We got Baba for another 20 minutes, family. So come on in. Let's ask Baba some questions. Let's mm -hmm. ask Baba some questions. And I and I'll start it off. So, so Baba, what are your thoughts when I just when I just shared what I shared with you? I said as a woman, um, just ha having to learn to accept covering from a man. Cause when you're not used to something, you know, it's kind of it's hard, Baba. You got to. So I had to start learning. Hold on, wait a minute. Okay, let me let the brothers. Even Baba, when you kicked me out, I didn't tell you. You hurt my feelings last summer. Mm -hmm. I'm just being candid. Remember doing the Asafo training camp? I mm -hmm. came for orientation. I was. I showed up, Baba, with mm -hmm. my shirt on, my Asafo training shirt, and we were like under the tree for a few minutes, mm -hmm. and then you were like deuces. Mm -hmm. I was like, I gotta go, and you was like. Yeah, you got to go. And I was like, okay. And I got in the car and I left. And I was thinking, I was like, I really wanted to stay with the guys. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I had to learn. No, you know, we got this. We we got this. We okay. We got these young men. We'll be fine. Mm -hmm. See you. You know, and I, I got in the car and I just kind of laughed at myself because I felt like I was getting kicked out of the crew for a yeah. little bit, you know. And so anyway, what are your thoughts on that? Just, just how do you think the brothers... You know, and I'm talking about the brothers, just like Brother Jawan's a fatty you. How do you think the brothers should handle, you know, sisters like myself, you know, who don't understand that? You get what I'm saying, Baba? Who yes. don't, um, you know, who we're not used to the protection and the nurturing, you know, from men. And we're, we're learning to to accept it. We're learning to. So how should they handle us? And, and, and I guess, Baba, yeah, how do you think they should deal with a person like me, like they come across a woman like me, you know, how do you think a brother should deal with me in that, in that respect? Yeah. So, um, African men, um, the ones who have arrived on the path of being an African man should also have the knowledge to know that many of our sisters have not had the experience of African men. So they're going to be, they're going to respond to an African man as they would to African maleness. And in most instances, most of our sisters have been abandoned by an African male, have been hurt by an African male, have had to fight African males, had to do, ward African males off. So their relationship with African males has been kind of contentious mm -hmm. and that's kind of an expectation. So when they run into an African man, they can kind of make the mistake that they also deal with an African male. And their initial response may be a little um, rejecting this African man, but we should be able to identify that instantly and help that sister to know that you're, you're dealing with something different here and we got to be gentle and delicate with her to help her understand that you safe with me mm. and I'm, and I'm going to make sure you get to your destination safe. Like that's our responsibility is to help her feel safe. That's a part of what it is to be a man is to create Safety, and I tell brothers that all the time. I tell brothers this way. I say, um, you might think that your wife is yipping and yapping and so on and so forth. I say, she's really not yipping and yapping. I say, she's speaking from a place of lacking to feel safe. I say, mm. so you have to help her feel safe. You know what I'm saying? Convince her that she's going to be safe, and and then you'll see her kind of pipe down. I say, our duty, part of our duties, is to provide that safety for our women. You know, mm. so across the board. And as, and I can honestly say every time I've come in your presence or in been around the brothers of PLM, I always felt safe. You know, when we come to your events, it's safe. I don't care where we are. It could be the race first rally. It could, you know, birthday, wherever we are, when we are around the PLM brothers, and I'm speaking about the women in my family, they're looking around and they know we safe. A brother's going to make sure that we get to and from our car and brother's going to make sure that we are protected while we are at the PLM uh, program. And so there was a question, Baba, is by, by sister um, Akachineke. She said, what would you say to the African brothers born here or abroad that have yet to acknowledge that we are at war? Really good question, Queen. So what would I say to um, a brother who have not, who have yet to acknowledge that we are at war? I think the best way to, con since I'm so in tune with what it means to be African, the best way to help us to see anything is to provide examples, right? So, the, so 
what I mean is that um, the raw, raw conversation oftentimes can't convey the points that you want to land. And that's one of the reasons why when you look at our story, you see a lot of folklore, proverbs, and things of that nature, right? Um, or myths, because we used all of that to convey truths. So if I'm trying to help someone to understand that we're at war, then I'm going to use as many graphic examples that I can find that I know of to help them see it. Um, and in some cases, the graphic examples causes a shock to that individual. So I have to be prepared to handle him when he goes in shock after seeing or, or hearing what I present to him. So the entire process is a developmental process and I must be willing, able and ready to walk the path with the brother. Oftentimes we want a person to get it just like that. But right. development doesn't happen that way. Consciousness doesn't develop that way. Consciousness develops in degrees. So if I really want to, if I really plan to help someone, I have to be ready to work with that person over time to help him develop into the consciousness so he can identify with and process the war that's being waged against us. Ashe Baba. Ashe. Um, is this our Baba Adisa or this another Adisa? Adisa no, that's, our, that's our Baba? Okay, that's yeah. our Baba. Okay, okay. I thought it was one of the Bulagoon. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. From you know, it's actually a family that goes mm -hmm. by Bulagoon. So my bad. Peace and love to Baba Adisa, who just dropped his book last, what is it, last Saturday? No, it was it was um the Saturday before last, right? Yeah, I think it was the Saturday before last, the 20th. It was the 20th. It was the 20th. So about a week ago. He shout out. So shout out to Baba Adisa, who was also um, one of the Baba's family of the Asafo training camp. And so, Baba, I got to get your picture and your, your bio so I can put you on the website. But peace and love to Baba Odisa. He said, how important is brotherhood to African manhood? Brotherhood is essential. And that's one of the parts I talk about in the book. So in the book, that's the area in the book when I talk about the core areas of manhood. And one of those core areas is brotherhood. What the brotherhood is, it serves as, and it serves as, a miniature environment wherein manhood is being honed and refined, because within the brotherhood of men, you got an you get you get an, uh, an opportunity to see how men behave and engage, and then whatever your troubles are or your struggles are, you can bring it within the brotherhood and receive the wisdom and the guidance that you need to continue on the path of development into a good man. So the brotherhood becomes that it's an institution. That's what the brotherhood is. It's an institution designed to, to not only develop the man, but also to support the man. Mm -hmm. And our brothers, would you say, um, Bobby Motep, that our brothers, not that the institution doesn't exist, because I see brothers click up all the time. I'm going, my boys, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. But um, do you feel like the institution... Um, I don't want to say this is dysfunctional. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you feel like it's, it's, it's like, because a lot of times I see brothers that are in cliques and they, they have a, I guess a brotherhood, no, but that's they, not a brotherhood. You that's don't call a, okay. Okay. Got that's you. not a brotherhood. And I talk, I also talk about it in that book. That's a buddy, buddy system. Come on. So that, so tell me that the difference between a brotherhood that's and a buddy, buddy, buddy system. A buddy, buddy system is not an accountability process. Come a on. buddy, buddy system is where we can come and we can, um, be reinforced in our own backwardsness, our own failures, where we can be supported at doing the wrong things, where we can get patted on the back for cheating on our wives, where we can get patted on the back and, and you know, and always made it make make the woman make it seem like the woman is wrong about everything. Yo, she crying and she yipping and she yapping and she nagging. That's a buddy buddy system. There's no accountability there. You know what I'm saying? This is just where we go hang out with each other at, and we call it a brotherhood, but it's not a brotherhood because a brotherhood is an institution that's designed to refine and sharpen to make you better. Mm. It's based in accountability. Mm. I say, Baba. I say. The next question, if I Benge says, at what point would you say that you should leave a sister alone with that conditioning if you see no change? Um, I, but I believe this. So you you leave people alone when they when they prove to be detrimental to you. But we should never engage in a process if we're not prepared for the process. What I mean is this. I'm not going to try to teach a person um, high levels of math if I know I only know a little bit about high levels of math. Because I'm going to set myself up. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that when we come into knowledge, we're too fast to want to teach other people. I think we should spend more time mastering our area. So when we do engage another person, we are fully equipped for all the challenges that their process is going to bring us. Because oftentimes we quit the process, not because the person can't be brought through, because we just not equipped to endure the process ourselves. Mm-hmm. So, it, so I think it's about if they're not detrimental, if they're not violating, if they're not toxic, if they just a little bit hard in their stubbornness, it's going to require more from you. It's mm. like me going to the doctor. You know what I'm saying? It's like me going to the doctor, but I got a broken leg, but I'm giving them a hard time to apply the cast. Then at some point, the doctor just give up. You know what I'm saying? That's on the doctor because the doctor should have been prepared. He should know that you're going to run into some patients that's afraid of a cask, right? He sh- they should have something in place where they can restrain me and do whatever they need to do to apply that cask, to not just say, well, we can't help him. And oftentimes, I think that's what we do. When we can't help this person. You know, we should be prepared for the challenge. And that's the reason why we need a brotherhood. We need a brotherhood and we need a Jagna, a Walimu, or a Baba in our life so we can get the proper guidance, so we can know how to do what it is we're trying to do and don't just do it. See, in the African world, we, we didn't do anything individually without being guided and shown how to do it effectively. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much for that, Baba. The next question says, should we be soft when teaching our children and develop into a level where we can say truth without, and I think they meant to say raw truth. So no. We should not be soft if I understand what you mean by soft. We should be gentle and we should be loving. Oftentimes we misunderstand what it means to love and we are um, overly soft. And by being soft, we tend to spoil the child. We should be assertive about children. We should, we, we should have um, boundaries and we should have expectations for our children. Expectations that we know our children can meet because we have assessed their capabilities. And we set these expectations in a system along the process to meet these expectations. We should provide boundaries and don't bend and don't break our boundaries because the boundaries instill structure and discipline. But we don't have to be soft and you don't have to be hard. You just have to be loving and you just have to be um, there and understanding. You don't have to be soft and you don't have to be overly hard. You don't have to beat your child. I have my, my, my two younger sons. I've never beat either of them. They're 10 and six and I never will beat them. You don't have to beat your child. If you introduce your children to a system of structure, if you, if you rear them in structure, give them self love, give them expectation, show them how to meet those expectations, hug them every day, tell them you love them every day. You listen to them. Allow them to engage in the process. Give them a voice. Encourage their voice. Teach them gratitude. Teach them respect. But teach them gratitude by being grateful yourself. Teach them respect by being respectful to them. Don't overly assert yourself. Don't dominate them. Right? Then you don't got to worry about being hard because you want to develop some beautiful children. How can I say that with so much certainty? Because I'm doing it. Mm. See, I don't mm. speak about nothing that I haven't done or that I'm not doing. I am the example. Mm. I'm not talking to none of you from a theory. This is None of this is theory. I am telling you what I have done and what I am doing and what I know to work. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Uh, Brother Jabril, Jabril uh, Africa said, Baba, how do you slowly walk brothers and sisters through and understandings that we are at war? as African people, especially understanding Caucasians are our enemies? So what I do is this, great question. So the first thing I do, like I say, we have to be real, real skilled about the work that we do. I don't believe that everybody is qualified to assist the person into, into consciousness. I don't believe because a person read some books and that they qualified to go bring another person into the knowledge. I see us doing more harm than good. Um, this is my process. I like to assess the person that I'm dealing with. So the first thing I do is allow the person to communicate because you're going to tell me exactly what you know, what you don't know, and you're going to show me what you understand and what you don't understand. 
then based on what you know and what you don't know, what you understand, what you don't understand, then I know how to begin to work with you. So the first thing I would have to do, depending on where you at, is to help reorient how you think. Mm. That's the first thing. Right. So I may it may take some time to get to the conversation that we at war. If I realize that you so far off, because that conversation could cause you potentially to run away. So the first thing I got to do is assess you, figure out where you at, let you allow you to ask me some questions, allow you to talk to me, allow you to make statements so I can see your cultural seed that you're coming from. And then once I have all that data, then I can figure out how I'm going to interact with you. And I say in most cases, the first thing we got to do is help them to reorient how they think, how mm. they process information and how they see reality. Help them through that. And once you can help them through that, I give an example. I'm going to use this example right here. Um, one, of, one of the things is an example is we talk about African spirituality and we talk about European religions and and if you notice, most people might say, well, I'm not a Christian, I'm not Muslim, I'm not Je Jehovah's Witness, I'm not Catholic, we, I'm none of these things. Um, and we say, well, we, we practice an African spirituality. But the mistake is this. See, most people think that African spirituality and European or, or, is, or, or um, Asian religions, we think that they sit on the same polar. So we think all we got to do is, is move across from European religions over to African spirituality. But they're not polar. See, African spirituality is not on the pole. It's not a polar opposite of those things. It's nowhere on there. So the first thing I got to do is help you to understand that African spirituality has no relation, has no bearings, has no similarities to European religions at all. So mm -hmm. you cannot even begin to understand African spirituality if religion is the framework that you're coming from. The first thing I would have to have to help you to do is to discard a framework of religion altogether. Mm. Mm. Once I can get you help you to do that, then you can learn after spirituality. But if you think it's just moving from European religion or Islam over to Yoruba, over to Akan, over to Igbo, you're gonna make a mistake because you're gonna operate those systems from a religious construct and they're not the same. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much, Baba. That was powerful. That was powerful. And there's another sister that shouted you out. I don't know the name because I just see numbers, but it says African men are extremely rare. That's why Baba said he's trying to change that, right? African yes, men yes. are extremely rare. She said, I've been to an event hosted by women. However, PLM brothers, PLM brothers, were there and I appreciated their presence. And yes, I was escorted to my car when I left the event. Peace and love to you, Queen. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Thanks, We're, my sister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for, for, for bringing that up. Absolutely. I'm like, wow. She said, even at the women's event, you get yeah. what I'm saying, Bible? Like, yeah. what the, even at the women's event, the brothers were in the building and the brothers made sure the sisters that were okay. But yeah, Baba's trying to change that, you know, as is Baba Baruti and all the other African. Uh, warriors. They try to change that. I say, and I see Marcy Appendix said, we need a version of this for, for women. And she said, she's ready to help. So African womanhood in the 21st century. So she said yeah. that we need to, she said, we need to, to get on that. And I told her, I put it in the chat. I said, let's do it. I told her, let's That's do right. it. So, so she and I are going to connect on that. Baba, before yes. you go, I just want to shower you again and, and ask everyone to join me right now. And I'm going to put Baba Imhotep's Imhotep's Ash app on the screen. I just dropped it in the chat family. Let's just shower him with some love. Like I don't, I don't believe in supporting people with solely my mouth. Right. Like, you know, some people, some people will support, you know, it's just my mouth. Oh, you do it a good job. And then just turn over. No, no, no. We got to support people with our resources. So family do me this. I want you to send him some love via cash app. Okay. Baba, do you have PayPal? Because some people may say, I don't have PayPal. I mean, I don't have cash app, but I have PayPal. Do you have a PayPal address or no? Yes, I have PayPal. Okay, so what's your PayPal as well? So this is your um, cash app. What's so your PayPal? PayPal will be the letter I. I. Right. My last name. I mm -hmm. fight you mm -hmm. at yahoo.com. 
Okay, so I'm going to put his, try to get him from all angles, Baba. Next is going to be like, which is L, Baba? But I just try to catch everybody. Because, you know, some people say, I don't have cash yet. Some people say, I don't have PayPal. Or some people say, I don't got, I got Zell. Or some now they're doing Apple Pay, Baba. It's just so much, Baba. So anyway, yes. anyway, I heard the feds are getting ready to shut that down. Because I heard they're doing, the feds are getting ready to regulate all of those different payment options. Because they're trying to track folks and their taxes and their money and all kinds of stuff. So I'm hearing that that's getting ready to come to an end. But anyway, family, make sure that we send Baba some love. His cash app is on the screen. All right. His cash app is on the screen, family. This is his PayPal, ifatiu at yahoo.com. So if you don't have cash app, make sure that you send him a love donation. And also, family, get the book. Baba couldn't give you everything in, in an hour, right? He couldn't give you everything in an hour, but he gave you enough, right? He gave you enough to get started on your journey, right? To, for my brothers, becoming right becoming coming into your african manhood and understanding what it is right and and then for the sisters now you have something that you can use as a barometer right so you meet this brother and you're looking at him and you say oh girl look at his beard and look at his muscles oh that is a man right not this you didn't even look at the content of his character see that's how we get caught up we're looking at the beards we looking at the muscles. Cause I know a lot of you sisters joined that beard game. It was like millions of you joined it on Facebook when they had the beard gang, Baba. It was a whole bunch of sisters. Yeah. Ah! And everybody was in the chat looking at all the men with the beards and mm -hmm. then the muscles. And we said, that's a man until we got got. So anyway, so to my sisters, make sure, <laughs> make sure that you grab this book, African Manhood in the 21st Century. And Baba said that you could grab it from him directly. All you got to do, family, is navigate to his social media pages. Baba, again, on Facebook is Baba Imhotep Fadiou. And on Instagram, it's Baba Imhotep. That's correct? Yes. All right, family. So let's make sure that we get this book. Let's make sure, family, that we get this book. The sisters are laughing with me, Baba. I said we thought he was a man until he got got. <laughs> so you thought he was a man. You saw the beard and the muscles and you said, ah! and then you got God. And your credit all messed up. You got a kid and, you know, it's all that. so let's make sure that we use this as our barometer stick. All right, Baba, do you have any closing words for the listening audience? Yes. Um, first, I would like to say thank you, as always, for an opportunity to be on a beautiful platform. Ashe. Um, I want to thank Ashe, the Baba. audience, those who came in to just listen, to be a part of this. And I appreciate each and every question. Um, I know we didn't probably didn't get a chance to answer all the questions that was put forth, but even if you still have a question and you want to just shoot that question to me through my inbox on Facebook, you can, and I most definitely will um, send you an answer back. But the, what, what I would like to leave everyone with is this here. Mm -hmm. We each are responsible to push ourselves beyond where we think we are at. Mm. We must acknowledge that we have a duty and a responsibility to move and evolve along the lines of righteousness. Ashay. And by righteousness, I don't mean passivity. I don't mean cowardice. I don't mean soft. Oftentimes we think religion has the monopoly on righteous. By righteous, I mean we must be right in our actions so therefore we must have good character. Black men and black women, we must do better with our character. Good word, speak what you're gonna do and do what you're gonna speak. Don't just be yapping to be yapping. Come on. Be real. We have to get back to a place of authenticity mm. and genuineness. Mm. And we can, once we do that, we'll see things to begin to change in our lives in our families, and in our community. Now, I'm not absorbing white folk for any of the junk that we have to contend with. But tonight, I want to talk to us. Mm. I want us to know that we, the African man and the African woman, is the primordial being. We are the sacred blackness that animates the universe. And because of that, we are the ones that have the responsibility to show up in this world as Tufu, as Oladamari, as in Yahweh, as Netta. That's our responsibility, to be the divine here on earth. Let's get the work done, black man and black mm. woman, and let's stop playing and stop complaining and stop crying. Now is the time to show up and evolve and transform. Let's get the work done. It's on each and every one of you. Don't worry about the dude on the side of you 
or the dude over there or the sister over there or the sister over there mm. why about you let's get the work done transform mm. black man and black woman Both my words. Fire! 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 Baba, we love you. Baba, we appreciate you. And we thank you for all that you have done, Baba, and all that you are doing, Baba. Appreciate you. Peace and black power to you, Baba. Peace. Peace. A BB Fahodie. A BB Fahodie, Baba. Woo! That was powerful, family. Make sure that you're in the building, family. Make sure that you're in the building on Friday. Bob is going to come back on Friday to, to give us a historical breakdown of race first in his meeting. F meaning, I'm sorry. Family, you don't want to miss it. All right. So you thought today was off the chain. Make sure that you're in the building this Friday for the historical breakdown of race first in his meeting at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Next time you come, family, make sure you bring somebody with you. Let's get this stuff. Let's get these, these Black Power Lecture Series virtual spaces filled up. So bring yourself, bring your family, bring your friends, family. Let's make sure it's over 100 people. And yes, we did touch 100 tonight. Shout out to you all, the people who shared, the people who shared this uh, this discussion on your social media pages and who may have text people. So shout out to the people who push this thing out. So let's make sure that we double that on Friday. Ashe and family also make sure that you send him some love. He gave us a lot of wisdom. He could have been anywhere tonight. He could have been anywhere tonight. You know, you, you gotta, let me tell you something. Let me say, tell you something. And I'm putting it in the, putting it in the chat again. And I'm gonna put his cash app up again. See, I value people's time. I value people's wisdom and I value people's energy. And so I, I'm, I'm humbled and appreciative that Baba Imhotep came on here and spent 90 minutes with us because he could have been doing something else. He has a whole family. He has a wife. He has children. He has an organization. He has business endeavors. He writes books. So he could have been doing anything with his time. Right. But he spent it with us for an hour and a half and he poured into our minds. He poured into our hearts and he poured into our spirits. So let's make sure that we uh, indulge in an act of reciprocity. I know we can't give him back exactly what he gave us. Right. But we can give him a love donation. So, family, make sure that you cash app him. Dollar sign Baba Imhotep. So join me. I'm going to cash app him again, family. Make sure that you cash app him right now. Also, family, he said that he has PayPal. So I know some of you are like, I don't have cash app. Uh, Dr. Maad, I got PayPal. So I'm scrolling up to the top. Here it is. Here's his PayPal address. I fed to you at, uh, at yahoo.com. All right. So family, make sure that you send him some love. We got to send, we got to send Baba some love. Also family, make sure that you're in the building for this all black student science fair, which is going down on June the 10th. It's going down on June the 10th family be in the building. So you see Zyax, that was a, um, a school founded by our brother Q Butter and Conscious Ingenuity, my, my organization, my institution and the all black agenda. We came together to, to put on this science fair for black children. We want to expose every black child to STEAM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And you can help family. You can help by doing this. I'm going to drop the link in the chat. Donate $10 to this event family. Here it is. It's throwing it in the chat. Donate $10. I think the goal is $5,000. So far, we raised $3,200. Surely, surely, surely. I, see, I feel like my mother preaching on Sunday. She said, surely. So surely, surely, surely we can reach that goal. So family, make sure that you click the link in the chat, okay, and donate to the Zayat Conscious, Con Conscious Ingenuity and uh, Black Agenda Science Fair. Last but not least, family, let's make sure that we get our children in STEM programs this summer. Don't have your child running around in a hot-ass house this summer just running around playing outside, make sure that you get your child in an enrichment program, okay? The UACI, the Uhuru Academy Conscious Ingenuity, we're offering a STEM camp on June the 20th through July the 1st. We have a virtual component and we have a in-person component. The in-person component will be in, in Columbia, South Carolina. The virtual component, of course, we offer it via Zoom, right? It'd be online. But we only have 15 slots. So 15 in person and 15 for the virtual component. Shout out to the people who've already registered. If you did not register family, click on this link. I'm getting ready to drop it in the chat. 
Click on this link. Let's get our babies involved in STEM. All right. You can't sit here. People talking, you pump, pumping your black fish. You're putting your black fist in the air. And then you don't give your children the tools that they should build. How are we going to be a, a sovereign people? How are we going to be a, a liberated and sovereign people? And we not and we're not producers of, of technology, which would require our mastery in science and in, in, in math. In the application of science and math is engineering, all right? So make sure, family, that you get our babies in this STEM camp, camp ASAP. They're going to be learning our African history, our story, right, as it relates to STEAM. They're also going to be learning coding. They're also going to be exposed to AI, artificial intelligence, and also cybersecurity. So, family, make sure that you get your children enrolled ASAP. You see the dates of June the 20th. I believe we're going to start cutting people off or cutting off the, the registration period next week. Okay. Cause we got to get this thing going and we got to solidify our count. So family, make sure that you have your children in the building. All right. I mean, yeah, in the building. And when I say in the building, in the virtual space or in the in-person space. All right, family, I'm out of here. I know I kept you on for an hour and 40, 40 minutes and I appreciate everyone who tuned in. Thank you again for joining us and please make sure that you come back on Friday for part two of Baba Imhotep's uh, lecture series, okay? The historical breakdown of race first. Enjoy the rest of your evening, family. Peace and black power.